Greetings, everyone. You're joining us at our second session of talks at Turkish Turkey Week, documentary film week organized by Unusemri Institutes in Berlin, Belgrade, and Zagreb. The main theme of this round of talks will be focusing on cinema history, documentary, movie, and historiography. We have three distinguished guests uh, that will be joining us today. Elif Rongen Kaynakçı is a silent film creator at iFilm Institute in Netherlands. She is also an archivist and she is also an applied historian. Well, that's how she defines herself. Milis Behlil herself is a associate professor at Qadir Has University. She's a cinema academician. She's also a movie writer, movie critic, and also a programmer at Açık Radio. Enes Reza is a documentary movie director, is also a movie director and movie instructor. In VTR productions that they are constructing with Nalan Sakıza, they are recording Turkish history at VTR productions. Well, we will proceed as follows. Three of our speakers prepared their presentations and they will be presenting their presentations. We'll be listening to them one by one. First, we'll be starting with Elif Röngen Kaynakçı. And of course, we will have some questions. Elif Röngen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much indeed. Well, I'm an archivist myself. For that reason, I see it in myself as a duty to raise awareness about archivists in everyone, to raise consciousness about. Well, first of all, that's why I thought uh, to bring up some ideas about archivists. Well, of course, we can discuss afterwards. Or you may direct some questions if you like. Well, of course, I personally have some questions myself that I'd like to delve deeper into. Well, in today's world, wherever we look at, we always see animated pictures. We see moving pictures on the bus, on the train, um, and the shopping centers everywhere, on computers and also our, on our mobile phones as well. That is to say we're constantly watching a movie. Maybe they're not uh, like feature films, they're maybe short films. They don't even have topics sometimes. Sometimes they're even short TikTok videos. But altogether, these are products that we can call movies because they pertain to the visual culture. But they're in such abundance that uh, we're not even noticing them and we let go of them, we don't see them anymore. We always observe them as products that we see everywhere and we consume everywhere. By the way, uh, like platforms such as YouTube and TikTok are themselves as we acts as visual archivists themselves. Though in the beginning they did not have such a mission. Since every minute everyone is uploading hundreds of minutes of uh, footages there, it's there. From everywhere around the world, we see a collection of these visual footages and videos on these platforms. But we need to ask ourselves, are they really archives or not? What should we think about its feature? That will be my question. Can we be sure that we will have access to these footages even after three years or 30 years? That's what I'm pondering on. We have seen it in the past. Sometimes we upload our pictures on a cloud, right? Because we think we will have an easy access on our f to our pictures on a cloud. But is this a really right kind of archiving? What if we can't access uh, to our photos on cloud? What is going to happen then? Because it's really different when people put their pictures on the shelves and their homes. These are the topics that I'm questioning myself. For that reason, I'm wondering myself. Uh, shall we lose all these images that are really important to us? Will we have access to them in the future? These are the topics that I'm worried about. Also, I'm thinking if we have an easy access to these pictures today, uh, that means that we won't have an access to them in the future or not. We can also observe it in our own attitudes. We would be recording everything, anything. Today, we're more relaxed because we know that we can find it anytime on the Internet. However, there's no such guarantee. 
And uh, I believe that looking at the situation that we're facing today, if we are being more and more relaxed, we will be sorry in the future. That's what I believe. Because I see parallelisms in the world history of cinema. I'm focusing on cinemas or movies before 1930s. It is a common belief that 90% of the movies and pictures that were recorded before 1930s are lost today. But indeed, in the past, in those times, there were like hundreds of copies of those films. And they were distributed to the whole world. And those were physical things and big things. And even though they had those copies, everything is lost. There were films without one single copy. And 80% of the production consists of these losses. Indeed, we are talking about such high figures. For that reason, if we believe that there is a copy somewhere in the world, is not a sound decision or thought. Indeed, I'm only talking about fictional movies. Documentary visuals are more prone to getting lost because documentaries are shot in the name of news, for example, in the content of news. And if they're not uh, actual, they get disappeared in time. Indeed, there is no point in keeping or storing them in commercial terms. There's one more thing I would like to state about this fact. If these actual vis visuals continue, but they transform in during the time, they get shortened and on TV they are given as a short summaries indeed. And so for that reason, we don't know where the originals, their originals are. For example, let's think about in, in our conversation with someone. Maybe in five years of time, we will just have one minute of that one hour conversation. These are mainly my focuses and worries. Since our talks are focusing around the issue of documentaries, these are the topics that I wanted to stress. Since I'm an archivist, these are my introductory remarks. And I hope and believe that we will be getting back to this topic shortly. Well, uh, let me ask you a question about archiving uh, methodologies. Are they digital, analogous? What do you prefer mostly? Well, indeed, what my statements are not just related to our own institution, our own uh, museum, movie museum, because we don't really store uh, the visuals uh, in, with the quality of a news, indeed. There are other types of archive keeping them, like TV archives. Uh, we are more about the movies. Uh, we are centered around the movies, indeed. We attach great importance to the movies that of cinematic value, that have cinematic value. We still believe that it's more proper to keep cinema products on cinema films. Yet we can say that the production that is being done in Netherlands for the last five or six years is totally digital born, it's digitally done. For that reason we cannot say that they're on the film, they're never on the film. That's how we receive it digitally, they're kept digitally, and of course we do some backups etc. But we are also using some cloud servers ourselves. Even if we want or we don't want, we keep it on the digital and visual it's on the cloud. Now uh, I'd like to give the floor to Enis Reza with VTR Productions. You're recording Turkish and Anatolian history on your movies. So my question is within your production company, what is your archiving? method and or archiving policy. Well, uh, I'd like to state that even if you wouldn't give me the floor, I would still be making contributions to what Elif has stated. Well, first of all, I'll talk about our own archiving systems and methods, but we're facing some issues in Turkey. 
In Turkey, we don't have an observatory nor a national archive. For that reason, every documentary maker, if we are still referring to documentary making, they have their own responsibilities of keeping and archiving what they have shot. But even at that point, we are facing some problems. Well, I'm not bragging, but it's my 55th year at this profession, in documentary making, I mean. That is to say, we started with negative stocks, but till the after the mid-80s, we resisted, it, but it was in vain. But, you know, when you compare it, its cost, we had to resort to the beta cam and digital. Well, as well as high definitions, of course. And now we are shooting with 4K. Well, uh, the last one that I shot, uh, this, the one that it's going to be screened on this festival, is a two-hour long film that we shot visual images between 15 terabytes to 20 terabytes. Well, we are using this method. We are watching out for the continuity of every plan that we shoot as beginning time code and final time code. For that reason, for that reason, we can say that systematically the visuals that's left uh, behind the film that the ones that we did not use those visuals of uh, 15 terabytes are systematically stored in our archiva stored on two hard disks but as a result this is a very dangerous situation indeed since in terms of costs in some cases in some times these hard disks should be transferred to other types of hard disks in time they need to be renewed and they also need to be protected, preserved. Yet we can say that this also requires a budget, since documentary shooting itself is not a commercial issue indeed. There has to be um, national institutions or public institutions support behind it. We can give it there and they can also store it in those uh, national or state institutions. Well, all the visuals that I have been shooting for the past years, we have approximately 400, 500 oral history studies. And each one of them is one hour, two hour, and even 18 hours. These are the times that these uh, oral history studies take. For that reason, we can say that even just when we focus on the oral history, the uh, subject of these documentaries are not unfortunately alive today, most of them, let's say. It's a history, thoroughly. But continuity is important when there is something we always consult the continuity. If we are to do just some studies about this, well, all these oral histories also deciphered itself. It is also printed on paper. For that reason, when the researchers consult to us, when researchers consult to us to make some research or consultations, we of course let them do their researches within the ethical scope. As I have stated before, it's all about the ethical rules and trust relationships. You cannot just give it to anyone. Regardless, in that sense, we are really afraid of the future. What is going to happen in the future? Our cinema history has such a past. There are, of course, some fires in the cinema warehouses. We are protecting them within our measures that we can take at 18 degrees in an environment without any dust or moisture. But maybe in the future there will be some earthquakes or there will be floods or they, there may be fires, other causes, casualties. This is our biggest fright and it's really giving me the creeps when even we talk about these uh, possibilities. For that reason, it's just like Elif says, there is a frightening future for us. We are really afraid. And second of all, if you permit me, for example, in all the public events, everyone, everyone is recording, everyone is shooting. It is really nice, but where do they keep these? Where do they store these? There is no common memory where we can place them. Well, I know that in Melis University there is an archiva, 
but I don't know the capacity or the limits of it. Apart from it, in the universities, do they really have archive a section or not? They don't. In the past, I used to take every picture, every movie that I should uh, to the cinema institution and let them make a copy of it. They store it in their own archive, but that place is now not functional. So we are worried about what's going to happen to that archive and what's going to happen to that one. For that reason, all these problems are giving me the creeps. They are in our lives. Sorry if I kept it too long. No, thank you. That was really nice. Uh, my question is this. You said everyone can get a copy in an archive, right? And they're also contributing to the history of writing, right? I didn't really mean that. It wasn't a really negative uh, comment on my side. That's exactly what I'm referring to. In order to contribute to the history of writing, um, you need to narrate a story, right? Could you please talk about uh, documentary and movie makers' ethical, political, and aesthetic impact on uh, collective uh, memory and their role in forming this collective memory and your own experience about it? Well, as I have stated before, it's my 55th year now. I shot my first movie in 67. Since 65, of course, I had other aspirations, like childish aspirations, and I was shooting my first movies. But it wasn't till 67 that I shot myself a serious movie, that I something that I took seriously. Through the end of the 68s, I formed and I founded the Young Cinema Movement. I was one of the founders of the Young Movie Makers Movement. Since then, we are shooting whatever is happening in Turkey, and we have shot. Back then, we were shooting 16 millimeters. Of course, they were silent movies. Back then, we didn't have sound films. We couldn't carry a tape for that reason, we just entirely used Rolex cameras and shot 16 millimeters. And even now, I don't know, just some part of those movies, they're, I don't know where they are, indeed. It's a really long story, I don't want to get in there. Well, for that reason, in the phase that follows that phase, we shot a lot of movies. Of course, the viewer always gets a master copy just a copy they get it somehow and it's kept somehow it is kept in an archive it can be in some archive or it can be in some one place for example it has itself a history of writing issue in that sense movie is contributing to the uh, history of writing itself but let's get back to the archive part about, for example, um, history of economics of Turkey um, since uh, 1453 to 1990. We shot a documentary called Logbook of Turkey's History of Economy. It is eight episodes, 240 minutes. Back then, we didn't have utilities like scanner or digital machines. We used to take pictures with the cameras, of course. If for that reason, when we calculate it, it's uh, like 400 hours of vision. It's like we were retaking from left to right, right to left, and let's do it again. This is not good. When I got into the editing of history of economy of Turkey, it was more than 400 hours of visuals. Approximately 70 people, both witnesses of the period as well as historians, for example, late Mehmet Genç. He was one of the most permanent historians. historians. Think about the episodes we shot with Mehmet Genç. We shot it with lots of historians that are not alive today. And there were people who were also living their own periods. For that reason, we had this huge pile of materials that consists of all these witnesses. Apart from the part that we use in the film, for example, with a person, um, with someone we shot for 18 hours. The person who organized the Sultan Ahmed meeting, the person who organized the independence movement in Izmir, at the same time being the Ottoman virtue forest engineer, 
and at the same time, the first person to make uh, mail distributions by plane. This is a person who established the Turkish Standards Institute. We were there just uh, a sh sh for a shooting of a couple of hours. Then we encountered with such a big, huge resource, and then we decided to use it. For that reason, it took to 16 or 18 hours. Of course, we gave some breaks. Oral history, of course, has its own regulations. You can shoot the most one and a half hour or two hours maximum. Well, to cut it short, it's um, material like this. Let me just briefly, briefly tell you a story here. In one of the movies, there is Jamal Yakut. In the Middle Ages, they were traveling city by city. They were collecting books from one city. They were distributing it in another city. Or they are selling it, etc. Imagine it like a second-hand bookseller, but a traveling one. One of the very most wise people of that era. During the Mongolian invasion, as you know, they burned down old books. They throw all the written resources to the Tigris River. There were so many books to have thrown that the Tigris River faces the danger of overflowing. For that reason, they give up the idea of throwing the books to Tigris River. They take them and they burn them. Jeval Yakut saves all that he can and he took it to an inn room. He enters there intending to die, but his pure intention is to give this heritage to someone before he dies so that he can rest in peace. Some people, just like in the example that I mentioned earlier, they were exactly waiting for us, it looked like it. They had this pure intention to tell everything that they have lived, everything that they have gone through to someone. They had this intention to convey the history, because I'll be also referring to this later on. I'll be referring to the relationship between a big, bigger picture of the history and the uh, daily events. It's such a feeling. Especially these type of documentaries always keep up the relationships they establish. We used to just call him every eat that we can. We were asking about his whereabouts and how he is. We were inquiring his health, etc. And our biggest fear was one day he wouldn't pick up the phone. And indeed that day came. He didn't answer our call. I don't know if I'm digressing from the topic, but um, I was really excited and hyped up after Elif's speech. For that reason, I mean, you're just forming a history, you're shaping a history like this. I mean, you're forming the shape and material of such a big history. And then maybe you get come across with some people you cannot uh, see in history books, and then you just construct a history from a bottom line. It is one of the most crucial parts of this documentary making. It is like you're always chasing surprises. You just try to come across with a um, coincidence so that you can construct this history from the bottom to the top. Or you can contribute to it, whatever. For that reason, here we have a lot of material. Some of our works, as I have mentioned before, some researchers take our works, uh, they use it in their researches, they produce something. I mean, you can contribute to the history outside the material that there is. Or you can just contribute with the visuals that you shot for uh, some other documentary, some other work. That means that you are shooting so many visuals that they're, they don't exist anymore. I mean, nature visuals, including the ecological visuals. It is the same in the cities. The images that I shot uh, from Mardin and Urfa in 1998, for example, you cannot just take this sh shot again. It, that Mardin, that Urfa doesn't exist anymore. That Istanbul doesn't exist either. For that reason, it is the basic material to establish the relationship between past and future. For that reason, documentary politically, ethically, and in terms of society, for example, is definitely one of the most uh, basic areas. For that reason, I have to give some details. I'm sorry if I'm taking up uh, your time, but this is one of the basic characteristics of a um, documentary. Now we'll be giving this floor to Melis Behlil. Well, uh, Associate Professor Melis Behlil has contributed to a book and it has recently been published by a very prestigious 
publishing house from Rutledge. It is the Decalogue series from Rutledge. Decalogue is a tour in between Decalogue and documentary. So basically, they choose one uh, documentary, and five different academicians and five different experts are interpreting this um, documentary. It is a very interesting series. This is a cat's uh, documentary. It is based on this cat's documentary. Uh, Melis Behlil will be touching on this book, and she'll also be uh, talking about Turkish documentary history. And I believe this will be uh, just leading us to uh, official history and history of the subjects and the inevitable comparison between fiction and documentary. I believe this is an opportunity. The floor is yours, Melis. Thank you so much. Yes, I'll be speaking about that book, and I'll also be speaking about the national cinema and also national documentary making and how do we position the cats and through all these teams i took a look at the documentaries that are done in turkey not just in turkey of course but this is a huge amount of time it's the long history i mean and i'll be briefly touching it and the, the things that uh, you mentioned earlier today that these are re really exciting facts for me indeed the relationship between the document and documentary that documentaries uh, also form a document themselves also just contributing to the document uh, formation themselves as he mentioned that we have uh, hundreds of hours of recording and the question that brings up with it where to archive them and these are the really questions that is uh, spinning around my head Maybe we could just consult to online archive usage and online platform usages. The production of online archives, for example. For those people like you, for example, uh, taking a long, long hours of shooting and then producing a documentary afterwards and using the rest of the material in, in some online projects and some other projects. These are all examples of sharing. We see such examples. Well, let me just briefly tell you about history of documentary. And I'll be, of course, more than happy if Enes Reza has something to contribute from himself, his own history. First footage uh, that are being shot in Istanbul are, quote unquote, can be called as document, uh, documentary. The first images shot of Istanbul is uh, shot uh, by the Lumiere brothers. Uh, Kamerman Premio in 1897, and it was about the pictures and visuals of Golden Horn and Bosphorus. And afterwards, we face in the Ottoman in, in area uh, the Manaki brothers shooting. Maybe one of the most famous ones are the Mehmet V's visit to uh, Monaster and Selanik. And these are the very first pictures or movies that are produced in these lands. But uh, with the uh, Turkish Republic, we see um, a formation of a culture more Muslim and more Turkish culture. We see the first discussions about the movies. And I believe Elif is really very much experienced about these topics. And in our official history, and in our official history, it's accepted as the uh, demolishing uh, of the monument in Hagia Stephanos. Fuad Oskunay made it in 1914. There are lots of problems there. It's a um, much debated topic uh, by the cinematography historians of Turkey. But none of us has seen the picture, and that's another topic, of course. And during the 20s, rather than the documentaries that are produced, we see, for example, movies by done by the army, such as News, and and I also find it very interesting the movies that are being shot uh, by the Soviets in 1930s, such as Yukirich and Oskarovich's movies. It, the, that one is called Ankara, the heart of Turkey. You can still find it on YouTube. It is there. And we have Esther Shubik, uh, one of the most prominent names of Soviet cinematography. 
and he has uh, this movie called Turkish Revolution Change Movements. They were really focusing on the, some developments in the uh, very first uh, establishing years uh, of uh, the Turkish Republic because there were some parallelisms between the uh, Soviets, uh, such as public houses, and these uh, movies are being shown in uh, public houses. I mean, this is rather kind of a mirroring what uh, Soviet uh, cinematography has done in the 20s. Of course, in the upcoming years, following years, there comes many documentaries, uh, shooting documentaries uh, here in Turkey, for example, from the BBC. And I would uh, especially like to mention about Morskielas, a movie that has been done in 1963-1964. There are six short movies done by him. Five of them were being shot in Istanbul. Only one of them were being shot in Edirne. Uh, the one in Adirna was about the oil wrestling. Uh, you can generally find them in the YouTube. Sometimes they tend to disappear and sometimes they appear again. As one of the features of, you know, the unofficial um, archives, online archives that are appearing and disappearing constantly. Uh, one of those movies actually attracted some attention lately because one of the Turkish TV series that's called Bir Başka, there's closing scenes, is using some footages of Pierre's Istanbul documentary. Of course, in the 50s and 60s, the most effective place and the most effective place in Turkey that uh, the documentary develops is undoubtedly Istanbul, of course. Istanbul University Film Center, which was founded by the Eibolu, we see documentaries that are produced there. Among them, we have the Hittite Sun that is uh, being done in 1956. And it has also been awarded in uh, Berlin uh, with the Silver Bear in his its own category, in a short movie category. When we remember uh, Berlin, we remember uh, the movie that's called Susuzias. We, we remember it as the first film to be awarded in Berlin. Yeah, we have a documentary right before it. In six years after the coup, a while later, uh, when the movie center was closed down, Eibolu starts collaborating with Ezajbaş family, and they shoot five short culture movies. The scripts were written by Eibolu, but the four of the movies were directed by a French, uh, who is called Pierre Biro. For me, it's really interesting to take a look at these, especially the movies that Pela has done here, that uh, in that area, comparing the ones who, that are done by Biro, because Biro is really collaborating with the documentary makers uh, and uh, movie makers in Turkey. It totally changes the language. You can clearly see how it looks and how it's reflected. It really changes it a lot. By the end of the 60s, of course, there is this young cinema movement. Ines Reza has briefly mentioned, but I'll be waiting for him to delve deeper into the topic. And as far as I'm concerned, after um, 12th of March, you don't know where those movies are located at. In that sense, I see with, uh, some parallelism with the young movie makers of Chile, just shedding some light on what's going on in the period of Allende. Let's record everything they think, and here we see this reflection of the same uh, thoughts here. Or Chile is our reflection, maybe. They're equal. In 68, we see TRT broadcasting, and it really uh, provides an opportunity to be shown uh, for the documentaries that are done in Turkey. In the beginning, they really got some huge support from BBC as training as in an establishment period. But BBC has always been a public television, but TRT has always been a state television. For that reason, it has always been spoken a state's language. TRT, uh, it still continues to be the same. And in 90s, uh, we see the appearances of the private TV channels. In the TRT's uh, documentaries, we don't see a lot of issues. They're really impartial. They don't really... Um, just to refer to the history. They don't really debate the topics that are to be debated. In 90s, with the private TV channels, uh, we see that they are shedding some light on the recent topics uh, that are being debated in Turkey. For example, Demir Kırat, that's been a documentary being done by Mehmet Elbrand and such documentaries. 
are seen in that period. When we get to the 2000s, as Anastasia has mentioned earlier today, we see some reflections of democratization coming uh, with technology. There's some circles that did not have the opportunity before making movies. Now they find an opportunity. They find a ground uh, to tell their own stories. They find ground to express themselves. We see Kurdish cinema makers and also they're also advocating for LGBT topics uh, in the movies. And history writing is also presenting us with the alternative histories. As Chan Demiraz 38, or another popular documentary that's called Two Languages, One Suitcase. It was not exactly a history documentary, but it was not possible to make it in the past. Or John Jandan's My Child documentary. And the, the expansion period and hearing different voices has been over. Uh, lately, we have seen uh, some legal cases with censorships and with whatever not. History itself is a much debatable topic in our country. History writing is itself a debatable topic. It's, but I would also like to talk about uh, one more thing. Uh, for the last couple of years, we have seen a lot of exciting documentaries indeed, such as Mimarolo using archive materials. Some of them are using actual materials and narrating a different type of story. In Storton's uh, States of Matter, for example, it's something really uh, recorded and shot uh, very recently, but, but it is shot in a hospital that doesn't exist in that form anymore, anymore as Enis has mentioned earlier. We cannot even find the things that are being uh, shot a couple of years ago. Let me just mention this and let me wrap it up. If you permit me, of course, yes. Uh, I would like to make some contributions. Yes, please, go ahead. I would like to apologize uh, from the start because it will be interfering to your field, maybe. Uh, the date of the first movie shot with the Muslim aspect is dated 1906. That is to say that document is a movie, but it is a movie of 30 minutes. It is shot in Izmir. It is being shot by someone called Kahya Hamid, and it's a billiard competition that is being recorded, shot in Izmir. And I would like to also add the fact that they always say that movie screenings always started in Istanbul, but that's not quite right. First movie screenings starts in Izmir. Let me also tell you this. Because Izmir and Selanik are away from the center and they're totally and purely culture cities. They're screening operas and they're staging theaters and operas, etc. For that reason, cinema also starts there. Second of all, this issue of 1914, I have a thesis. When they decide to demolish the monument, Yes, they're using dynamite, etc., but it really takes a week long to demolish that monument. For that reason, they, when they signed the, the statement of its uh, demolish, they say that let's shoot it into a documentary. It's an historic moment, they say. They sign a deal uh, with a movie a team from Germany or Austria, and the movie uh, crew comes, but uh, when uh, there is only two hours till the demolition, they say, just let a Muslim record this. In that period of time, Fatus Kunai is in the army. Before his army, he's in army, he was in the Galatasaray Istanbul Sultani. He was making screenings there, he was showing movies, and he is someone utterly interested in the cinema. For that reason, they bring Fatus Kunai. Like they, they don't have the concepts such as cameraman. They call it someone like machines, machinist, or mechanic, something like this. They tell Fatus Kunai how to shoot it, and Fatus Kunai really shoots it. Here, this, this is my thesis, okay? This is just a speculation, by the way. You know, they're like street photographers. They're like instant photographers. They took off the lid from the objective and then they take the 
picture and they put it back on and the camera is back down and they were called receptors. Those, re those receptors exactly used the same technique back then. But in addition to that, they're rolling in a certain speed. If they cannot really find the, the exact speed, it's either too fast, either too slow. Here goes my thesis. I, I repeat, it's just a speculation. They told him how to use the camera, but they didn't uh, tell him to take off the lid. For that reason, Fatos and I really shot that movie, but since he didn't take off the um, take off the lid, they don't really shoot that movie. There is no such movie. Even the daughters of Fatos and I are ignorant of that movie. They don't know about it. No one knows it. Let me just skip this fast, and especially the uh, documentary cinema. I believe Nazım Hikmet is the central axe of Turkish cinema because he's after some things like making the movie of the poems. There are movies that he directs. He has written some scripts, some incredible ones. Yet he also has two documentaries. It was shot in 1930s. One of them is Bursa Symphony and another one is Istanbul Symphony. For that reason, when you take a look at the world in that time, they have Moscow, Sim Moscow Symphony and Berlin Symphony. With this concept of city symphonies, they shoot movies. Um, most probably, they are aware of the process in the world. And as Mikmet shoots two movies, and after that, as Melis mentions, we also see traditionally Ebolo, Adnanberg, Ipshirolo, and Albek team. And afterwards, a younger Altan Yalchun is being added to that team. Altan, Altan Yalchun uh, functions like a bridge, and he's also forming a part of our young cinematographers' movement. We lost him early. His such brother, and we constructed ourselves tied up to that tradition. And one more thing, I really like to apologize for interrupting. Emils has given this Shirley example. That is quite true. For example, as in 1968, we were discussing third cinema in Paris. I mean, when we were establishing a young cinema, the third cinema uh, concept comes in with its audience, uh, with the directors, with its crew, with an active or rather say interactive audience. In that relationship, it uh, really led to production uh, of a different uh, type of com uh, communication. That was the understanding behind the young cinema movement. The movies that we shot back then were shot with that understanding of the past, but we lost the basics of the third uh, cinema uh, the last year. Its director at the hour of the uh, ovens. That, that's really sad. I would like to apologize once more. It was an interruption. Sorry. Thank you so much for the additional information. Yes, Solanas, you're mentioning. Yes, exactly, Solanas. Solanas took part uh, of the conversations in, in Paris. Back then, Paris was really active. And we were uh, seeing cinematographers, cinema makers from all around the world. Uh, we would just debate and talk. First of all, we were talking about the, uh, with the sound dial uh, cameras with Shuru Folar and etc. on the streets. It was the time when the camera was on the streets and we have seen the third cinema movement and debates there. Yes, when you were mentioning Chile, I was thinking about Guzman. Yeah, I wouldn't really remember him, but Guzman also is also studying uh, pictures and movies uh, in Europe, and he's also feeding in the from the same resource as me. So I have this uh, another question uh, regarding the studies uh, and articles of Turkey uh, cinematography and documentary history. What are the resources that you are consulting to? because there are lots of topics and lots of um, articles and books about the Turkish uh, movie history. Are, are there any reliable resources? Thank you so much. I was really about to mention that, but I really forgot mentioning that. Yes, 
my article was focusing on the cats. It was dedicated on the cats. For that reason, I was I did not really do some scanning of the history, indeed myself. But I consulted the Hakan Aitekin's PhD thesis, and then he published uh, it as Turkey history uh, of documentaries. And also, there are some articles written by Jan Jandan. And there are some short articles written by them. And uh, in the past, uh, there are some uh, old articles and old uh, resources. For example, uh, in Istanbul University uh, Film Center, uh, the articles written on that center, but they're really limited resources. Uh, it's just one book, and it's not even enough. Turkey history of documentary is not enough. And I believe and I hope that there will be even more researches about this in the future. Yes, our basic problem is the problem of resources. Elif, I would like to remind one thing. Enis Riza was directed, directing uh, the Neolithical um, areas, uh, eras of Anatolia, and until uh, Saturday, you, it is being screened, and you can also uh, consult to this movie as an, an open resource. As Melis Behlil mentioned, as Mimar Olu, it's a very avant-garde movie, and uh, it was one of the opening uh, movies of Monday and it met with its audience in Europe and in Turkey and also there is a chat uh, a talk with the director. I would like to ask I left this question before 1930s. You're focusing on the era before 1930s. You're witnessing the era and do you think that uh, there is a relationship between the fiction and uh, documentary, what is the approach of the official history? Could you please just elaborate that? Well, as you know, I am an archivist, and documentarists uh, consult us. They ask for resources. Of course, there there are some very different projects. They're coming from different countries, and they have different attitudes. So it's all about what the topic is. So there are some differentiations. For example, there's such topic that um, there is no image or visuals about that topic. So they are trying to overcome it. Some documentaries try to overcome it. We are really witnessing this. For, they're coming from different countries. And uh, for example, even if they have visuals, um, they're lost and it's, they're inaccessible. Uh, they are trying to make up for that lack. Uh, these are documentaries are aiming to cover that up. Uh, it's like something um, just trying to be constructed in abstract. Uh, they're coming from Middle East, uh, Southern America, or Eastern Europe. Lately, we are receiving lots of uh, people from Eastern Europe, uh, for example, Poland. It's, it's been founded in 1980s, 1990s as a country, for example. Before that, of course, there was an, a part of an empire, and it was part of Germany, etc. Uh, apart from 1990s, they're trying to establish their identities, but they don't have any visuals. They don't have uh, footage. Uh, when we asked, they said, we don't have it. And where are they hidden? Where are they located at? Bef they really have trouble about this. Even they find some visuals in us. They, it is really recorded in different, um, under different names, under different limits and um, borders. There are some issues. Yes, there is a visual, but it's deciphered differently. And since it's this deciphered differently, can they access this? So there are some problems, there are some issues, but they're trying to face these challenges and overcome these challenges. Apart from this, um, well, let me put it this way. We're trying to see the person who is coming. Um, sometimes there are some themes and uh, they don't know any boundaries, for example. They don't know any time. They don't know any geographies. Uh, lately, in the documentaries, we have seen these international productions. It's about the uh, uh, product 
tourists, for example, producers uh, conditions and in documentary makers also work internationally these days and producer companies have, for example, four uh, common partners. So one is coming from Al Jazeera, but the production company is located in uh, France and it's funded by Al Jazeera. So the, there are some researchers and archivists in researching this is from Denmark, for example. So it is uh, just about to the email. I'm very surprised, really. Why uh, is someone is writing f about this project to us from Canada or Denmark? Wasn't this a French project? We're really surprised about this. It is beautiful indeed because it's a collaboration and uh, they are really making the most of the uh, resources and uh, uh, different people from different backgrounds are uh, working together. In terms of archives, this is a richness and archivists and archives should really make the most of it. And there is a production company, Animo. It's based in Athens. Really, we are delighted to work with them, and they're collaborating in with Turkey. I know about this for that reason. When we take a look at their crew, we see, uh, for example, they ha they're really solving the puzzles that we cannot really uh, solve. We're just provided with the visuals. We say just this is being shot in Balkans, such an abstract. Concept. They have Romanians, they have Turkish, they have different crews. For that reason, they can de decipher it exactly. And when we receive it back, we try to catalog, we catalog it better. For that reason, it's a really big opportunity for us in terms of archiving. And we are really making most of it. For if we are really working just on our own, it's on our database. It is not really going to lead anywhere for that reason. It is there or not there for that reason. We see such movements, such motions in terms of archive, in terms of production companies. Thanks to these works, we, we can see that some uh, visuals are uh, getting back to uh, public. And it's really inspiring us as archivists ourselves. Uh, we had these projects of since 2004, Ottoman Archiva. It's a research and presentation um, topic. Uh, we have seen lots of visuals in the European archivists, for example, uh, Balkans. Uh, our, the archiva is, they think it's uh, lost. Uh, they have the Üsküp, Karada, and these countries. Maybe they don't have comprehensive archiva, but for example, uh, we can say that uh, Albanian archiva is active and they have a really good director. Uh, they're looking for the visuals indeed. Yes, there are some images, visuals that exist, but you need to really look for it. It could be an archivist, it could be a documentary maker. And you need to just match it with the one that's on the shelf. It is our biggest duty, I may say. As Ines mentioned it earlier today, I want to say you mentioned we, in order to make a movie, we had this archive of 400 hours. Yes, we're a little bit sick. I mean, we're obsessed. But all of the archivists are doing this. When you take a look at the Netherlands, I know I don't know if you know, in the Netherlands, uh, for example, we are a really strong country in terms of documentaries, but every documentary maker has its production company due to the conditions. For that reason, they have their own archive. Huh? So a movie means an archive on its own. So they don't really consult to us. Uh, we don't have the automatization. We are trying to speed this up, but it's problematic. As you mentioned, these terabytes uh, relatively as a national uh, archive. Of course, we have this um, storage capacity of tetabytes, but generally uh, we can dedicate uh, this uh, terabyte for a movie. We cannot really limit this. There are costs to, to it. Everyone thinks that it's easy. 
it's there here we think but those servers are constantly working and its transference in time is a cost but i like to say that there are footages of 400 hours so uh, we don't know uh, what will they mean for future generations but when i take a look at the future for example in 1960s or 1950s in Amsterdam, there are some house movies. For example, um, a family moves to a house, they're shooting, a father is shooting, and a woman is cooking, and children are playing in a garden. So these are the cliches of the 50s. And when you take a look at it, there is no special quality to this movie indeed. But on the contrary, it's just a steward hype. Uh, family, but we see one quality, for example, uh, the architectural history. They're making a uh, history about uh, arch documentary about uh, history of architecture in Netherlands. In some cities, we see a boom in those cities, and we see the emergence of new districts construction. And uh, they're constructing this. And how do you construct? Uh, you're, they're thinking about the philosophy of it. And it's a need uh, for that reason. Now, after 50 years and 60 years or 70 years, when you take a look back, it's a topic for analysis. Maybe it just looks like a clerk, but the um, the architects that are seen as clerks of the state are now iconic um, architects. In the archives, you can see that when people move that to house, how did they use that? How did they cook in that oven? And what that child were doing in the garden? These uh, were just uh, some critical questions, but there are indeed some modest mo house movies. That wasn't the intention of the movie indeed. But today, it really fills a different gap. Maybe in the past, it was a new district opened by the municipality. And this was just a documentary about it. And this is the only documentary. It just took place on the newspaper. But uh, now we are seeing how children are playing. It is just a footage that is being uh, recorded by a family. And in terms of ecology, these are really important topics for us. Uh, for example, it, is this river going to be a drought in the next decades? Uh, we cannot foresee, but when it happens, people just consult to archive. They are asking for the previous visuals of it. In terms of documentary, um, uh, this is hard to predict indeed. Uh, for that reason, we should keep the visuals and images that we have. I'm sure in the future it will be used. I'd like to take the last remarks, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to give the floor, uh, floor to Enes Reza and make a short question. And the ancient history of uh, Anatolia, the Neolithic era documentary. So what was the reason that uh, you did uh, this documentary just to leave some documents, visual and audio document to the feature about this era? Yes, first of all, uh, there's this situation, as you know, um, in the past, we we were working in different areas. We were thinking about immigration, any type of immigration, historical immigration, and actual and recent immigration are the topics that we are working on. And we are also working on archaeological areas. Archaeology has uh, this uh, point, for example, uh, as in terms of Neolithics. It was not perceived as it, something that belongs to Anatolia. Um, just two decades ago, it, it ha was perceived as something else. Neolithic started in Anatolia, and Anatolia was the center of Neolithics. Uh, we were not really thinking about that. There, we were uh, always looking for it in any other areas. I'm not really delving deeper into this, but Anatolia plays a crucial role, especially Mesopotamia. is a really crucial 
place. I mean, in terms of climate and geography, it is of the biggest importance. When we were really dealing with this, uh, they were really excavating in a couple, and they were they have seen the footprints of eight thousand years ago, and they have seen Fikir Tepe, Istanbul, uh, where Mehmet Professor Mehmet uh, excavated in Yerimburgas, and they have seen a past of six hundred thousand years and some findings. It's a Neolithic area with Yeni Kapu. We were really very excited because. Uh, Yeni Kapu was the uh, transference part of the Neolithic area, Neolithic uh, era from Anatolia uh, to Europe through um, Istanbul. So we started the research. Ten years ago, all the books that are written, uh, let me not exaggerate, but they are full of errors or they are misleading. So. Uh, we can say that history is uh, being rewritten. That's what we are excited about in terms of archaeological sense, starting from the Mesopotamia and uh, uh, Middle uh, Anatolia, Istanbul. And uh, we can say that it is a really important geography to the, uh, to the travel to Europe. Uh, Neolithic era is an equalitarian era. There are no borders. There are no wars. There are no conflicts. And the communities are in peace and in balance with nature. I can really tell a lot of qualities to this when we take a look at from this perspective. In today's world, uh, all the things that we are dreaming of and all that we are af uh, afraid of in terms of ecological, it can this be an inspiration to us, can this be a model to us, that gives us this idea, that gives us this motivation, that's why we started this movie. But it also has this quality, especially, well, we you're shooting some place and you're just talking with people and holding conversations when you depart, and after 10 days, they find new findings. So there are places that we revisit. Uh, we revisit and we reshoot. We see different things and they find new findings. Uh, for that reason, it's a very dynamic uh, history. So the, you're establishing connections between past and today. For example, peasant women working there, farmers, especially the archaeologists working there, they want women to work uh, uh, in terms of excavation because uh, with the sensitivity and delicacy and attention and fast uh, learning capacity that comes with uh, being a woman and with the sense of responsibility, uh, whatever those qualities are, comes with it, and they are really de defining. Yeah, these are all the parts that we have done. These are all our cups, and uh, they're also thinking and discussing about the meals and uh, construction of the houses uh, that they have done 13,000 years ago, and they're also establishing relationships with the past. These are really exciting facts for that reason. In the sense, we have done this movie, but we really couldn't get over this excitement because our movies really take um, four years or five years and are independent movies. It had a calendar. It was fixed to a calendar. For that reason, we had to finish it. Um, well, last thing to as a contribution to Elif, uh, yes, we're shooting some movies for four years or five years. I have a movie that I have been uh, 
shooting uh, for the last decade. We're recording nannies, rituals, and funerals in diff 12 different um, languages. We started with Betagam Digital and HD 4K. Now we're talking about 16K. So our basic problem is Elif this. The last movie that we made was done in HD, so it took us four to five years. Uh, we use Betagam uh, Digital HD, so we just put it in HD, four to three. I have another movie that uh, I'm making. It took three to four years, and it's going to be four to three. So it has a nostalgia for us. Um, we're trying to uh, create this nostalgia, indeed. So uh, there's a movie that's being shot for 40 years by a documentary maker, um, wife and husband, and they're following the children in a neighborhood for 40 years. It's an astonishing movie. Think about it. For example, we have a Greek uh, friend uh, shot it for 15 uh, or 20 years and uh, followed the, all of the processes of a city. So with the transformation of the technologies, we have witness this technology says whatever you should if you have money I will make it qualified but this is uh, also about a serious budget uh, it's really a dream for most of us for that reason all the documentary makers we are in trouble in this sense well uh, the closing remarks I'll be giving Melis the floor uh, you mentioned uh, the mm, states of matter and being the architects, and you talked about uh, uh, festivals and international festivals. Uh, just new uh, samples, examples of the documentaries and cinema uh, movies. Uh, we don't call them uh, documentaries. They are called pictures, movies. Non-fiction, right? Yes, they, they are called non-fiction. They're not documentaries. Melis Behlil. So, but the reason, what are the reasons of this bloom? What are the reasons of this explosion, the boom? What's your take on this issue? Well, let me try that. I would like to just answer to a uh, Rizas uh, Ali Özgantür Archiva at uh, Kadir Has Information Center. It is the first archiva of Ali Özgantürk's. All the pictures, photos, videos, there are lots of materials. And in terms of online, I'm not sure if it's uploaded, but uh, there is an access to some of it, uh, as it is you research it. If you research it as when you consult it as Kadras uh, University National Culture uh, Documents. So let me not just pass this and answer. So, why do we just face such a boom? To be honest, we see the explosion of the documentary and it's experimental. And uh, we're following this as movie makers and we see that movie makers are applying this and a uh, new film fund has made contributions for the uh, last years. It's also supporting a different take of the movies. And it's uh, regarding the zeitgeist, but it has practical scientists. Even if you develop such great ideas, uh, they, you need a budget. You need a support. It's hard or you cannot take it far for that reason. Uh, you need support. Well, I mean, with the zeitgeist, uh, I refer to all the movies that's done in the world, and uh, all the movie makers are collaborating with, for example, Etienne Pecker uh, is uh, Missile Conservator, and it's just uh, uh, they're exchanging ideas uh, and 
It's just the editor himself. So there is a good environment uh, at circles with the impact of pandemic. Uh, maybe in the following years we won't be seeing such projects, but I hope uh, there will be more. Documentary makers has different ethics. They're sharing, they're caring. Um, uh, sorry, yes, I'm interrupting, but um, back to 90s, they did not have cinema schools in Turkey. When they changed the policies, exported policies, new uh, cinema makers could enter, and I call 2000 years of cinema makers who has the formation, who studied cinema, who studied photography or theater. They have this serious uh, formation and education for that reason. It caused an explosion, a boom effect in the movie industry. Yes, I totally agree. In the festivals in the yes, Amsterdam's, uh, Amsterdam festivals, uh, we have such incubator activities and events where people meet and we, where people support uh, script writers and uh, producers get in touch and they're, they get in touch about these, their projects and there are good advantages to this and we are working hand in hand with them uh, step by step for that reason it takes four to five years uh, each project in those uh, projects and process uh, these exchange of uh, ideas are really effective and and I would also like to mention uh, this um, uh, they were talking about maybe we'll see the uh, impact of the pandemic. How will they affect? Uh, I will also. Uh, I, I'm most worried about how this is documented. This pandemic period. I believe after three years, we will be. Uh, we will be forgetting about this period. Uh, how did we just pass our times in the helm? And when we tell this to other people. It would be sounding like fantasy. No, that's that's not real. People sitting at home for a couple of years now. So how should we document this? And I'm really worried about this because we tend to forget during the uh, first year of pandemic. Every day uh, we have seen the hospital workers, uh, the, the short footages that they were shooting, uh, what's happening in the hospitals, no one is going out and the streets are empty, nothing is happening. But the hospitals were buzzing and they had these sh shootings. I hope that they are really uh, archiving them well because they're very valuable. And since they're showing, uh, because the truth about this, also um, another topic that made me think about this, uh, the photo awards were uh, being distributed in the Netherlands. And normally, they're shooting the animal pictures, the Netherlands uh, photographer were shooting crows. Uh, from the balcony of his house and then he was awarded and in a talk he said I could not really travel and I was thinking I was not working but as I was watching the crowds I just wanted to shoot and that's how it became as serious it just shows the pandemic it shows the crowds but it, indeed it shows the uh, pandemic and then you see the children sitting on a bank uh, so it's something that belongs to these days and a lot of documents belonging to these days I hope and believe that they will be catalogued and collected and archived in a most correct way and uh, we will be seeing them in the uh, future yes we're bored we should get out that seems and uh, since we're really bored I'm really scared we, we will be skipping this and uh, we will be erasing this period of time and we will act like it never happened. I hope it ne will not happen that way. As a consolation, I would like to add one thing. I know one documentary maker from Denmark with the connections from different countries. 
every person in every country uh, phones to three or four people and they will be following them and they will be recording them with the uh, visuals from his own house that was the uh, idea of the documentary and they're going to make it a feature film indeed and it's going to be an online project and they t uh, started to uh, established the first phase in the title uh, Connections. It's a multinational project. Uh, there will be more projects, yes, more movies. Yes, we have also uh, participated. We are making, yes, the, as the union of uh, documentary cinematographers. Elif, uh, maybe you can say this. Uh, iFilm YouTube channel has some visuals uh, from 1930s. Is that right? Yes, of course, uh, we share it on YouTube. When you take a look at the um, pictures from YouTube, we have uh, visuals from Istanbul, 1910s. We have Venice, uh, Northern Asia, um, Northern Africa, Tun Tunisia. We have this uh, understanding. If um, if there there is no copyright about this, we can open this up. We can show this. Then there is something called iFilm Player. It started in the past, but we open it fast, and there is some are of course with um, some expense, and some are uh, without any charge. Charge you can access uh, this. Uh, maybe there are some fiction movies and theme movies. There are short movies and themed movies, feature films, and the, you can ex access this from any part of the world, and uh, you can access uh, it from anywhere around the world. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Erfan Gankaynakci, Ms. Behlir Raza. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I hope our audience really enjoyed this talk. Uh, Berlin Zagreb Yunus Emre Institute organized this Turkish Doku Week, uh, this documentary week, and we have this uh, cinema uh, history and uh, cinematography writing. Uh, talk has ended. I enjoy. Thank you.